Welcome to the Bible class of Jews for Jesus with Bob Mendelson. Tonight we're reading Judges chapter 11. A man you might have read about in the record of Scripture, Jephthah. You've read about him in Hebrews 11. He's in the Hall of Faith, Hall of Fame. He's a judge, a military leader for the Jewish people in our story. Jephthah Yiftach means he opens. And I believe it's an acknowledgement of his opening the family line of his father Gilead. And it's also prophetic in that he will open a door of peace for the Jewish people in his adult life. Gilead is his father. Gilead had sex with a prostitute. And although this was a dishonorable act for a Jewish man, he brought both the woman and his son into his own house. That's unusual. So he's adopted. And Jephthah was the firstborn among his other brothers from Gilead's own wife. The younger sons of Gilead drove their brother Jephthah out, and he became an outcast. Sounds like the story of Joseph some centuries earlier, doesn't it? Okay, so from outside the camp of Israel, Jephthah takes up residence and is making a life. He's up north in a place called Tob. All of a sudden, when the Amorites came to attack the Jews from the east, the Jewish leadership there in the town where he grew up in Gilead, the Jewish leadership invites Jephthah to be the leader. (laughs) Let's read the story tonight. So from outside the camp of Israel, Jephthah was living up in a village called Tov. Good, a good village. He's hanging out in a good place. Good. All of a sudden, the Amorites come down the mountain and they're attacking. Now, mind you, they've been attacking for 18 years. We saw that last week. 18 years. So there must have been a particular occasion where they mounted a large force that was coming down against the Jewish people here in Gilead. And they send for Jephthah, please come and and help us. You're a mighty mighty warrior. So he says in verse 7, Hello, don't you remember? (laughs) You're the ones who hated me. You drove me out of my father's house. So who drove him out of his father's house? His brothers. But these are the leaders of the town, Mm -hmm. which tells me that his brothers, or at least a single brother, was now a substantial member of the community. And maybe he's the voice of the community. So Jephthah says, "Uh, why'd you come to me now when you're in trouble? You know, it's a great line. From this, we learn that the brothers were having been coached by the leadership or they were the leadership. Jephthah reminds them of this wrong action. And like Joseph, again, back in Genesis, he asks them if they're serious about this invitation. They assure him that if he leads them, he can be the Rosh, the head of the Jewish people, verses 9 and 10. So Jephthah prays. I hope you don't miss this. Before he started his campaign against Ammon, he... Look at verse 11. He spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. He didn't just talk about God to the people. He spoke to God about the people. He asked for help. He told God what was happening. He prayed. Then he went to battle. That is what we're supposed to do. We will not surprise him with our information. We're notifying him that we know he's God and we're not. That's the essence of prayer. You are, we aren't. Get that right, your prayers will be answered. The future leader then initiates a negotiation with the king of Ammon. Look at it in verse 12. Sending word that the battle isn't right since we're occupying the land. Basically, he says, what are you doing? What is, verse 12, what is between you and me that you've come to me to fight against my <laughs> land? My land. Do you hear it? But what does the, the Ammonite king think? Why is it their land? It always was. Historic. Historically, Historic. right? But when did it become the Jewish people's land? And why did the Jews invade? Yeah. Because they didn't let them pass through. So the aggravation was there at the, the toll gate. Yeah. I'm sorry, you're not welcome here, remember? So he chronicles it, passes through. All we wanted to do was pass through the land and get to our land. But the king and all the kings there on the east said, no, thank you. Let me show you this just so you can see what we're talking about. I'm going to make it wider. And for you online, apologies. But I'm going to show you. See the brown? See the green? I don't know if brown and green is indicative that brown is bad and green is good. I'm not sure. So this, of course, is the land of Israel, and there's the River Jordan. And this is the area we're talking about with Gilead, Arnon, the Yavok. Those are the rivers that separate Ammon, Moab, Edom, all these sections are divided by creeks or rivers. 
Because remember, these aren't permanent settings. The, the Jewish people are not in tribal settings today. So when it's given to us, it doesn't mean it's given perpetuity. There are times, there are seasons, and we have to look at things mm, in their time. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Nineveh, Jonah was sent to preach to it, and they repented, and that's great. And then 80 years later, nobody was sent to preach to give them a chance. They were destroyed. So it's just a matter of yeah. timing. Mm -hmm. Everything's about timing. So that's the area. We're east of the Jordan River. Um, Israel's irrigated because of cleverness and the other places are mm, less clever. So Jephthah initiates a negotiation with the king in verse 12. What's this between you and me? He sends word that the battle isn't right since we're occupying the land. What are you doing? So the king of Ammon writes back in verse 13. He said to the messengers, take this back to Jephthah. Okay, you took our land, give it back. It sounds like spoiled children, really. If only they had a United Nations or a CNN. Uh, Jephthah sends a fairly long history History email back to the king, reminding him of what happened when we escaped Egypt and sought to travel through their land. The kings of the land actually denied entry visas to our people. And in fact, Sihon, the king of the Amorites, fought against us. We had to save our people, so we had to fight him, Og, and Sihon. And thus we gained control of the area of geography. It wasn't our original idea. But thanks to your king, Sihon, it's now our territory. So it's your fault. You initiated the battle, we fought, we won. Mm. I don't know what the, the, the people who want to give Australia back to the Aborigines or America back to the Native Americans, or some who argue that Israel ought to give back land to what are nicknamed Palestinians, would say to this, but the Bible makes it clear. You conquer it, it's your turf. Have a nice day. Okay? Verse 23, after this long write-up of the history, since now the Lord, the God of Israel, drove out the Amorites from before his people Israel, are you then to possess it? Jephthah says the problem is not really between us, king of the Amor Ammonites, and me. It's a matter of your God versus the real God. Thus he even says in verse 24, why don't you stay where your God Chemosh gives you land? <clears throat> So he, he's basically saying that we were away for 300 years and you could easily have dominated the land in that time. Where were you? Why now? You see, you guys are just mad that we own it and are doing something with it, which you left for hay and weeds. By the way, doesn't that sound familiar today in light of modern Israel and the controversy of certain tribal areas? Nobody wanted Israel in 1850. Yeah, there was nothing to it. And now we've, we've built it up and they say, you know, we'd like our, our land back. Yeah, where we're so it's the exact sound of Jephthah to the Ammonite. So what's the king's response? Verse twenty-eight. He did not listen. That's what it says. Or in our Bible, it says he disregarded the message of the judge of Israel. But the Hebrew is pretty clear. It's the word Shema. I've been thinking a lot about this, um, an awful lot about this. There is a, a church in Connecticut, in the northeast of the United States, that every once in a while invites me to preach there. A uh, lovely place in Bloomfield, Connecticut. It even sounds nice, doesn't it? Bloomfield. It's under snow right now, but it's, it's a great place. Around the beginning of the new year, they wrote me, and not just me, but to an awful lot of their own folks, and people like ambassadors or missionaries that they support around the world, and said, we're going to be taking the next 21 days from that seventh, the uh, first Sunday of the month, <clears throat> praying and seeking God, and then sharing together what we hear from God. And I thought, Pretty cool. Then I saw at the bottom, would you like to join us? I thought, yeah, that's an awesome idea. So I joined them on that Sunday morning, and I, I was praying from there in Rockhampton where I was, and they were praying in Bloomfield, Connecticut. And I started hearing about things from heaven and pondering God. And I decided, you know, I could put up a YouTube. Yeah, in fact, I think I'll shoot a YouTube of what I was hearing that day. So I did, and I sent it to them, and they said, great. And I said, okay, I'll do another one. So every day for the last 12 days, I've been sending this up. And, you know, the before I send them this YouTube, which is public now, and I'm putting it on my Facebook and YouTube. And before, But before I start saying things, hey, here's what I'm thinking, you know, 
know what I have to do? I have to listen. I have to really hear from heaven. This is what God's saying to me. And I, like all the rest of them, are sharing with each other in home groups and maybe <clears throat> maybe from the pulpit. I, I don't know how they're doing it there in Connecticut. I'm far, far away, 10,000 miles. But that idea of hearing is so significant to me this month. And when I was reading this and saw that the king of the sons of Ammon didn't hear, seriously, disregarded the message, I thought, well, that's exactly not what we're supposed to be. As believers, we hear God's message. As unbelievers, we disregard or don't hear. I, you know that it's not he who hears, but he who does, which is re- who is rewarded. Blessed are they who hear the word of God, Yeshua said, and do it. I, I mean, I get that. But you can't do it unless you hear it. Mm. So you've got to hear and what's the watchword of Judaism? Shema Yisrael. De- Deuteronomy 6.4, that's right. Shema Yisrael. Hear. Listen. Listen, Israel. Don't, don't tell others about it. Listen. Get connected. And God judges Israel left, right, and center. I mean, just, just do a Google search or a concordance search on the word listen or listening or hearing. And you'll see how often as we are copying it from heaven that it's because... We didn't listen to what God said. So that's what I'm hearing for myself. And I don't know how you'll take it. I don't know how the people online who are going to hear this message are going to take it. But And it's 2018. It seems so fast. I don't know where 2017 went. But it's, 20, it's 2018. And what are we going to be saying about 2020? 20, 2021. What are we going to say about 2018 in a year, two, three years? Oh yeah, that was the year God spoke to me and said, and I remember when God told me to. And when we hear those things, write it down. Write it down in your journal, write it down in your computer, write it on your blog. I don't care where you write it, but write it somewhere so that you don't forget it. Yeah. And when you don't forget write it on your wall. What's a mezuzah? Okay, what's a mezuzah? Literally, what is it? Well, it's this, well, okay, it's not the scripture, but it is. And you point and you even angle, which is clever. Um, the piece of jewelry we put on the mezuzah. Because a mezuzah is a doorpost. And the mezuzah cover, that little box that has the scripture inside it, some scriptures, is there to remind us. You're right, you well said it. And what's it reminding us of? What, is this, what does the, the scripture rule. say? The rule. Mm, it says, well, beyond Shema. that. Yeah, okay, it's Shema. Yeah. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall speak them diligently to your children. Which means to pierce them into your children. <laughs> and you shall speak about them when you sit in your house, walk on the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And you shall inscribe them or write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You should write these words. You should write these words. <laughs> you ever see, I mean, look, look at that poster up there. That, that's the words of God. I mean, those are reminders of who God is, what he's done. And if you have a Bible passage written on your wall, some, you, you might invest in some chalk this year. Yeah, a piece of chalk. And write on your wall the words of God that really speak to you. Psalm 4610, be still and know that I'm God. Or John 14, 1 about you believe in God, believe also in me. For John 14, 27, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives, my peace I leave with you. You know, when you ponder these things and you write them down, if God speaks it to you, write it down in your journal or on your wall. That's why I say chalk so your landlord doesn't kill you later. Uh, But somehow let it reflect itself to you so that you're hearing it again and again. You know, we sometimes say Hebrew prayers that we remember from our youth. And I like that. Or songs. Uh, I asked you about singing earlier. Do you, you know, do you sing at that meeting you go to? And it's good. Um, singing helps you memorize stuff. I was listening to the ABC quiz the other night. Sometimes on the drive home, 7.30, 8 o'clock, I, I hear these people calling in and, and uh, trying to answer these trivia questions. And sometimes they go to a, uh, a sound <laughs> question or a sound. And it's always songs and who sang it or what's the name or what's the next phrase. And I think for some reason, I know these things. Why do I know it? Because singing almost stamps it in me. So if you can sing those verses that you write on your wall, al mezuzot betecha, on the doorposts of your house, go for it. Then, then it's, it's becoming you. Think about it this way. Reading the Bible 
is like walking past a beautiful bakery. You smell it, you say, ah, oh, this is really good. Memorizing the Bible is like taking a bite of a bagel, fresh, hot, right out of the oven. Oh man, this is fantastic. Meditating on the Bible is when you swallow that bagel and it becomes part of you. Smelling it, good, senses, mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. Biting into it, tasty, healthy, good, well, not. But it, uh, it's, it's delicious. Letting it become part of you, that's even the best. Reading, memorizing, meditating. You can't meditate on something you haven't memorized. You can't memorize something you haven't read. Does that make sense? Mm. Let's see if you can do that. This is all from the word Shema, that the king disregarded or didn't listen to the message which Jephthah sent him. What, what, what could have happened if he'd listened? There wouldn't have been a war. Mm -hmm. All his people would have survived. Jephthah would have still had, I mean, his diplomacy skills would have been fantastic. Hmm. He didn't listen. Not a good idea when a man of God speaks to you. It's almost as if the music in the movie changes and you and I and everyone else knows bum 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 problem coming. This is a mistake. Trouble awaits the king. We'll see how that plays out in a moment. Remember last time we saw how God sent an evil spirit into the camp of the men of Shechem in the story of Abimelech. Today God uses his Holy Spirit to come upon Jephthah, verse 29. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and to empower him to know what to do. Look, it did happen now and again in the record of the Older Testament that people had that unction, that anointing from above. But it wasn't available to, to everyone until Shavuot, Pentecost, after Yeshua rose from the dead. And God poured out his spirit on the 120 and on anyone and everyone who now seeks it. So Jephthah did something that we see a few times in the Bible, a man making a vow. And that's where I'm going to be controversial. Some of you have heard about this promise, this oath, and wondered what happened. I'll try to clear that up for you in a minute. But that a Bible character makes a vow is normal. It's sort of like, if you do this for me, God, I'll do that for you. Jacob did it. If you get me out of this, my, my brother Esau's coming to kill me. I'll give you 10% of everything I got. Elkanah did it, Hannah, David, on and on. We already saw Gideon do that earlier in this book. So Jephthah makes one, verse 30 and 31, and promises that if God gives him the victory, Jephthah will do something in return. So that's exactly what happened. God again gets credit for the victory and Jephthah wins the battle against the Ammonites. I love it. The scene immediately then turns to the house of Jephthah. So we see, we don't see the congratulatory comments from the people of Gilead. We don't see the parade around back at home. We don't see the newspaper article. We see Jephthah going home. Nice. He returns to celebrate his victory at home. His home was now in Mitzpah, the scene of the agreement of Laban and Jacob back in Genesis. And he has to live out a vow he made to God. His daughter comes out of the house first. Yikes. He has to do something with his daughter. What was that vow? We know it involved God giving him victory. But what was Jephthah's promise to God? Here's what it says in the Bible in verse 31. In his vow, he says, Then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, meaning after I win the, the victory, I, I return in peace, that it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. But I want you to read the word or instead of and. Either I will donate it if a person to God, or I will sacrifice it if it's a kosher animal. I mean, he couldn't say, well, let me just stay with it. Think about it. If Jephthah mm. were to try to fulfill the vow by killing his daughter, he'd be violating Torah. Yeah. Leviticus 18.21. Somebody find it for us. If Jephthah won the victory, had a great time with God, was satisfied that God had heard his prayers, and came home and killed his daughter, he'd be breaking Torah. That doesn't sound like a vow that God was involved in. He would have had to do something else. He would have had to ask a priest in Shiloh, miles away, to break the Torah in killing the daughter. And there's not a chance that the people would have allowed this either. Look, who is Jephthah just now? What did he just do? He beat up the guys who've been beating us up for 18 years. He's, he's now like John Monash. I mean, he's a hero to the country. He's like Donald Trump. No, he's, uh, <laughs> no, but let's say he's recognizable. He's a hero. He's the military conqueror. 
And he goes up to Shiloh, and the people are going to go with him. And the people are going to go, and, and his daughter's going to be there. And he says, I'm going to kill my daughter now. They'd say, no, that's not, no, you can't do that. So he'd be uh, scandalized. It would have been huge news. And no way would the daughters of Israel, look what it says at the end, have commemorated this four times a year. See what it says? Verse 40, the daughters of Israel went yearly to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. Well, if you're you're a daddy and you kill your daughter, hey, you know, my girls, I wanted, they drove me nuts sometimes, you know, and I always threatened them, no, I'm going to kill you. No, of course I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and even more recently, anyway, no, no, no. <laughs> No, no daddy would do that. I mean, it's just a horrible thought, right? But how could the daughters of Israel commemorate this in some kind of, you know, satisfactory celebration? Tana is the Hebrew word to commemorate. The King James, I think, said lament because they were trying to help make it into a sad moment because they saw it as he killed the daughter. So the King James authors made the word Tana into lament, but it doesn't mean lament. Commemorate, okay? Hmm. This whole thing would have been a Shanda. The commemoration is a recounting of the story. No wonder he's listed in Hebrews 11. How could you list a man in Hebrews 11 who broke Torah, who killed his dog, see? Hmm. He's a man of faith. He gave away his own legacy <laughs> for the good of Israel. By the way, he could have gotten out of this vow by paying extra. That's what Leviticus 27 says. Mm. And he probably would have been fairly wealthy by now. I'm just guessing. Many other judges had dozens of sons and grandsons, but Jephthah had none. He ruled for six years, but he had no perpetuity. That's the fulfillment of the vow. So I read this vow of Jephthah in, in, as this. I will give whatever or whoever comes out of the, my door to the Lord. Meaning to virgin and perpetual service to the Lord, like the ladies at the bronze laver in the tabernacle. Um, Frank, would you read Exodus 38, 8? Here were some ladies who donated their mirrors, and the mirrors became the bronze laver that was used in the tabernacle of Moses. So they were ladies in service there at the tabernacle. And that is what happens to Jephthah's unnamed daughter. She becomes a perpetual servant to the Lord in his ministry. If the first thing out of his house had been an animal, uh, which had to be kosher, clean and appropriate, he would have offered it to the Lord as a burnt offering. But if the first thing that came out was an unclean animal, he couldn't have offered that. Mm -hmm. So there, he didn't kill his daughter. It's not recorded that he killed her, and it's wrong to make the Bible say that. She lived in perpetual sadness that she wasn't able to bear children, which was normal for a Jewish family in that day, and dare I say in this day as well. Yeah, yeah there's all kinds of activities. I don't know which one she was involved in, it doesn't say. But she was Here's not a clue allowed. in leading class. When the Bible is silent, you be silent. If you don't know, you just say, it doesn't say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could make it up and be really cool, but you might be really wrong. Well, she wasn't married, and she lived as a perpetual virgin. Life. And that's the commemoration that these... And the, why did she go up to the mountains and weep? What does it say? Why did she go up to the mountains and weep? Because of my virginity. That's right. She was ever perpetually a virgin. Mm. And so she wasn't going to know a man. She wasn't going to have children for her sake. And certainly when you think about it, for her daddy's sake. Mm. So here, here she is doing what Isaac did when Isaac uh, agreed to go up to Mount Moriah with his father. And Isaac said in Genesis 22, Hey, Dad, there's the wood, there's the fire, where's the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, The Lord will provide. Yahweh, Yireh, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Yeah, he'll, he'll provide. And Isaac and Abraham, it said, went on Yachtab. They went up the hill together. Meaning Isaac said, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen, but I'm going to go. And he was a willing sacrifice. Here's Isaac, 30 years old, Abraham, 130 years old. And Abraham, I mean, Isaac could have taken out that old man easily, right? Strong, strapling Isaac could have knocked over the old guy. Mm -hmm. But he willingly allowed the daddy to put him on that altar. That's 
That's that's the grace of being a servant. Mm -hmm. And that is what Jephthah's daughter did here as well. She's going to let, I mean, listen to what she said. She said to her father, verse 37, let this thing be done for me, let me alone. My father, verse 36, you have given your word to the Lord, do to me as you've said. So she understood, she had faith, that's a house of faith. She had been raised that God was going to be God and we're supposed to submit and do what God said. And if I'm going to be ever a a virgin and never have children, so be it, Daddy. I'm not going to make you break your vow and give me to a man and have children and grandchildren for you. I'm not going to do that. So she had faith as well. Brilliant, brilliant story. Just dangerous to say Jephthah killed her. But that's common. That's commonly what's said up. And it's a horrible thought. The story of Jephthah is sad in that he has no legacy, but it's rich in faith. So let's us be careful to live by faith. And also let's be careful not to make hasty vows. Mm -hmm. Let's trust the Lord, but let's not negotiate with him. Mm -hmm. He can and will send his Holy Spirit to lead us. We have a job to pray to him, to tell him what's happening, to trust him with our lives and with the lives of those near us. Let's be careful to give him thanks and praise for this story of the man of faith and our lives and the lives of faith of all the people in this room and who've been in our rooms before. Amen. 